Hi class, welcome to this last video for our molecular genetics unit on DNA technology. In this video, we're going to look at how DNA can be sort of manipulated uh, for various uses. So we're going to look at DNA analysis, which is three different steps. Take a look at cloning, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about in the news. And finally, genetically modified organisms and genetic engineering. What do those things mean? All right, so first we're going to look at DNA analysis, which is um, got the three steps to it. So if we want to look at somebody's DNA or compare somebody's DNA to somebody else's, how do we go about doing that? Well, the first step is something called polymerase chain reaction or PCR. The idea behind this is whenever we start with somebody's DNA, we generally don't have a lot of it. We're taking it from a crime scene or from a small blood sample and we don't have a lot of it. So we need to amplify it or make more and more copies of this DNA. So there's only a small amount that must be replicated. PCR is just simply the process of rec replicating DNA in a test tube. So you start with one copy, you make more copies after the second cycle, after the third cycle. After 20 or more cycles, you can end up with over 2 million copies. Um, you'll learn more specifically about that process, maybe in AP Bio if you take that in a few years. But just simply for now, no PCR amplifies or replicates DNA. After you have a lot more DNA to work with, you now need to do something else to it, and that's cut it. So you're going to cut it using restriction enzymes. So uh, restriction enzymes cut DNA at certain sequences, and the idea behind this is that everyone's DNA is different, so everyone's DNA is going to be cut at different sites, and so therefore you're going to get a different product. So let's take a look at this picture over here. Here's your DNA double helix. In red, you have your restriction enzyme come up to it, and then it just simply cuts it. And that restriction enzyme actually originates from a bacteria. Bacteria have these in their um, cells to act as a defense mechanism to cut up intruding uh, DNA. So it'll cut our DNA just the same. And it cuts it, and then here you see now we've got two pieces of DNA where before there was only one. Okay, so now we have uh, various pieces of DNA. Let's look at an example of how this happens from start to finish. Here we have, um, instead of looking at like a crime scene, we're gonna look at a normal person who doesn't have a disease versus a diseased person. So here's their DNA, and what we're seeing here is three different restriction sites, meaning that enzyme, that restriction enzyme is gonna cut one, two, three. It's going to cut three times on that normal person's DNA. On this person's DNA, on the different person's DNA, it's going to cut only twice. It's going to cut here and it's going to cut here. So it's going to yield different fragments. So we're going to just take these fragments and we're going to put them through a gel electrophoresis and you're going to be able to see the differences between the diseased person and the normal person because this person has one, two, three, four fragments, and this person has one, two, three fragments. So that's an example of how restriction enzymes can cut different people's DNA in different places. So like I said, once we cut the DNA, the final step is doing a gel electrophoresis, and you guys are going to be doing a gel electrophoresis lab um, next week in class. So the idea behind gel electrophoresis is that fragments of DNA, after they've been cut with restriction enzymes, are separated from each other as they migrate through a support gel. And the gel is made from a material called agarose. And you're going to get to see and feel this next week. The pieces of DNA are separated based on size. And that's a question I have for you on the next slide. Um, and they are separated based on size, but they're also based separated based on an electric current. So here's what a final picture looks like. Let me show you a more simplified picture of how this happens. So here's your gel. You apply in red, this is representing the electric current. When you apply an electric current to DNA, it's going to run down the gel. And the idea behind this is that DNA is a negative charge because of those phosphates. So it's going to run towards the positive side. So here's the negative electrode, here's the positive electrode. The DNA is going to be separated through the gel uh, because of that electric current. Um, your assignment is to tell me what size fragments end up here at the bottom. Are the small fragments down here or do the large pieces uh, come up here? So this is where your DNA is. Your DNA, DNA moves down the gel. I want you to tell me what size fragments end up at the bottom. The small fragments are the large fragments. And why? Why would that be? 
So to sum it all together, a lot of people, um, maybe even on TV shows, you hear the term DNA fingerprinting. This is a test to determine the unique information stored in somebody's DNA compared to somebody else's. So it can be used for forensic if you're trying to find um, what DNA matches the crime scene of a suspect, uh, a paternity, identify missing people. And so those three steps we just went through, PCR, restriction enzyme, and gel electrophoresis are the three steps that a forensic lab might go through in order to find out whose DNA was left at the scene. Each person's DNA has a unique fingerprint or a unique banding pattern that's different from somebody else's. Okay, our next big topic is cloning. Um, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's when you make exact copies of an entire organism. The first time this was successfully done was with a sheep. Maybe you um, have heard of the sheep named Dolly, but it has several uses, um, not just cloning whole organisms. Um, but what we can do is with animal um, with animals, we can um, maybe with a mouse, for example, we can genetically modify a mouse to have certain traits for medical study um, or to research, and then we can clone that mouse so that we have multiple um, uh, mice to study. Researchers currently are looking into taking somebody's own stem cells and cloning them and then putting them back into that person's body because those stem cells, as you know from earlier in the year, um, have a lot of potential to become any type of cell and can really heal a person if they are diseased. And finally, um, cloning can be used in genetic engineering, which we'll look at here in a second. So here's um, the, what I was talking about with animal disease models. They're genetically engineered to have disease-causing mutations, and then they're cloned to study. And then, like we said, some researchers are looking right now to create more stem cells from um, a person's own body without using uh, embryos, and they hope to be able to even grow whole organs, for example, a pancreas, from somebody's own stem cells. If they say if they have type 1 diabetes, you can take your own DNA, clone your own stem cells, and maybe possibly grow your own uh, organ. Okay, so genetic engineering is the, um, the last big topic I want to talk about using plasmids. So most genetic engineering involves bacteria. The first step is to remove the gene you're interested in from the host organism. This will make more sense when I give you an example. Then you're going to insert that into a plasmid. A plasmid is a small circular piece of DNA found in bacteria. Humans, uh, mammals d generally don't have plasmids. Sometimes plants can, um, but bacteria have this little, just small piece of circular DNA uh, inside of their cells. And then once that bacteria has that gene of interest, we call it a gene of interest, then we simply grow that bacteria. We replicate that bacteria so that we have a ton, a ton, a ton of bacteria, and therefore we have a ton of the gene that we want. So here's an example. Um, the gene of interest that we're wanting is the gene for human growth hormone. So we're going to take that from a human's uh, DNA. We're going to cut it with restriction enzymes, and I'm going to show you why on the next slide. We're going to take a bacterial plasmid. We're also going to cut it with the exact same restriction enzyme so that therefore we can simply insert this gene for human growth hormone into the plasmid. Now we have a plasmid that we now call a recombinant plasmid because it has DNA from two different sources. It has DNA from the human in purple and it has DNA from the bacteria in blue. Then we take that plasmid, we insert it into the bacterial cell, and then we simply grow that bacteria. And now we have lots of human growth hormone um, for whatever purpose. Um, if you have a disease where you're lacking that hormone, you're not growing properly, well, I bet you that the medicine you're getting comes from this process. So, like I said, we cut here with restriction enzymes. So I'm going to show you here why we do that. And remember, we cut the plasmid as well. The reason, oh, sorry, before I go to the next slide, I want you to come up with two other examples of genetic engineering using plasmids. So here's a figure showing why we use those restriction enzymes. So here, say, is your uh, human DNA. Here's your bacterial plasmid. You cut both using the same enzyme, they're going to come up with sticky ends, and then these sticky ends, once you put them together, they're going to stick together. And now you have your recombinant DNA. Um, just a little bit on genetically modified organisms, or GMOs. These are living organisms, such as produce that you might find in the store, actually, whose genetic material has been artificially manipulated through genetic engineering, possibly using a plasmid like I just showed you. 
they're done to make the food look better, make it shinier, uh, make it taste better. Uh, some examples are soybeans are given resistance to herbicides so that they grow better. Uh, corn um, that is naturally resistant to insects uh, without using insecticides. So these are just some genes that researchers are going to put into these uh, living organisms to make them better. Another assignment for you, come up with two other examples of GMOs. And I'll leave you with just a quick interesting fact. When you go to the store and you see the little PLU codes um, on your produce, these are what you're looking for. Conventionally grown banana might have that PLU. An organic one is this. And then a genetically engineered banana is going to have a different PLU code. So just something interesting to think about. And we'll see you in class for the lab next week.